أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين and for a new beginning and a fresh start to this wonderful organization, give them a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I was recently hired to do some motivational speaking for a major company. And they have about 17 offices around the states. And they bring in their head, head people in terms of their corporates. So I was hired to speak to about maybe 30 to 40 corporate level people. And it's amazing, subhanAllah, how you shift everything. And you just take your lectures a hadith by Imam Ali, Rasulullah, and you implement things that they've never heard before. And these guys are top of their field. They've read every sales book. They've read every aspect. So you come at them with something that's not new, there's no respect. I'm telling you this because we don't really respect and honor what we have. Because the amount of energy that was in that room was just electrifying. All I would do is I would take a hadith by Imam Ali alayhi salam, and you will put it out there. And the response is incredible. How? You'd see how they what? Every single person when I would say a hadith, they would start writing things down. It would just it would resonate. You would feel the energy in the room. And that's the power of what we have. But do we really understand that? Do we really understand who we have and what we have? That at the end of the day, when I'm about to leave, they're chasing me, asking me for my number. Why? Is it me? It's not me. It's the thought process I'm giving off. That's all it is. It's the mental constructs. But where did I learn this from? Look at the teacher, don't look at the student. That's the power that we have. But do we realize that we have this? I don't think many of us do. And I really think we take it for granted to a whole nother level. Because you are on the inside, you're not on the outside. But when you see how thirsty the outside is, my God, I see where do you, it makes my hair stand up. When I'm talking to this, this corporate making six figures, but I'm talking to him directly in his face. And I'm just giving him a hadith by Imam Ali alayhi salam. And he has no idea where it's coming from. But it elevates me. Wow. But again, do we realize what we have? I don't think we do. I really don't think we do. So, for the ones who have come put the best brand in the world with about 1.8 million or billion employees and still growing. The ones that marketed to the highest level understood that they needed to get this message to us today. Give them a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> now, in the Quran it says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah says to us, He says, "Who are the you kawinukum fil arham, or you sawirukum fil arham? Kaifaysha? He's the one that fashions you in the womb of your mother, as He wills." What is Allah telling us here? Allah is saying to you, "I've at this point, I'm fashioning you to such a point. I'm putting the tools that you need in life, meaning that I'm I know the limitations of your trials." I know what tools you need. I'm fashioning you. I'm giving you everything that you need and every single tool that you will ever need in this life at that moment because I fashion. 
Can Allah create something that's not perfect? He's creating you perfect for your own trials. Why? Because he says further, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Meaning I will not burden you beyond your capacity. Meaning I know what you come from. I know your origin. I know the tools that I've given you. So every tool that I've given you will actually be used for certain situations that you will face. So he's guaranteeing you at this level that any situation that you will face at any point, you have a tool for it. And when you have that tool, he's also guaranteeing you that what? You have a chance and it has a solution. Because he's telling you guaranteed there's something, there's nothing that you cannot overcome. And he's telling you, I've given you the tools to overcome it. Furthermore, he gives you a prophet. He gives you a book. He gives you imams. Seriously, what do we need more than that? It's part of your own system already. The answers are within you. But again, we whine, we complain. When you start looking at life this way, your whole perception will shift. Everything will shift. You will see different colors that you have never seen before. This is the power of what we have. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because you have to understand a point of security. And a point of security is crucial for what I'm about to give you now. Because when we're about to give, it's very difficult. The heart is attached to the wrong things. The want is attached to the wrong things. Meaning, my heart is attached to a set of concepts that are not the best for me. Let me give you the essence of what I'm talking about. What is a value? A value, if you really study it, is a concept that's infused with emotion. Meaning, that that concept has a lot of emotion behind it. Meaning that imagine when someone at some point comes into your house and you see them attacking who? Your mother. Would any of us question, question, or even think about protecting our mother? Why? Because that concept is infused with what? Emotion. But it's got a lot of emotion behind it. That's a principle, that's a value. But that's entrenched in you. That's a piece of your identity that you cannot remove. Now study yourself. That's an opportunity to study yourself. Imagine someone who's never heard this stuff before, and now they're on a corporate level, and then you give them this stuff. They're just blown away, but they appreciate the value of that, which I don't think we do. But who are we getting it from? It's not about me, please. It's not about me. Look at the source and where it's coming from. Are we doing our job? So that's a value. Now when the heart is connected to material, it's connected, there's nothing wrong with that. But it should be connected to higher things. There's nothing wrong with being connected to material. When it's the means to a goal, no problem. There's a use for it that can be used the right way. But when the heart needs to give and it's attached. The want is attached to the concept of wait, hold back, don't give. It's very difficult. So now, what does the Imam say about this? He tells us at this point, even before I go further, just give us a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He paints a beautiful picture for us. In terms of being, now let's say you began in the womb of your mother. He says, I fashion you there. When I fashion you, I've given you the tools for your trials. And now, what is that journey? He paints a beautiful picture from the beginning to end. Imam Ali salam, he says, live in this world and live it this way. At this point, he begins and he says, don't be the banker. He says, number one, before that, he says, work hard. 
have a hard work ethic and go after this world. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be the one that says, you know what? Allah bi'ati. Allah gives. What is the first, what's the counter argument to that? What did the other person say to you right away? Isa ya la isa ma'ak, right? That's the, first, the other guy right away. Is here. You have to do both. Allah is telling you, I've, I've set that sustenance for you, but there's conditions that you have to meet to get that sustenance. You can't just sit at home and just be praying. No, you have to go out and meet those conditions so you can earn the substance that I've given you, that I've set for you. So there's conditions. So work hard. He says, have a hard work ethic. Move in this world. Don't wait. Work hard. Then he says to you, but be careful. This is amazing to me. This concept that he puts out is just unbelievable. What he says next, he doesn't, he doesn't even, he skips, he doesn't even mention money. He says, don't be the banker or the accountant for others. What? What does that mean? The Prophet comes in and explains this beautifully. The Prophet says, he says, the money that you have in the bank, and I'm paraphrasing, the money that you have in the bank is not yours. How? He says, the only thing in this world, when it becomes yours, is when you either spend it on yourself, spend it on others, or give it to charity. So there's a condition, you've earned it, but you have to do something with it. For that, whatever you have taken from this world, he gives a condition. For it to be truly yours, there's another action that you have to do, which is what? Spend it. But imagine you spend it in the way of Allah Azza wa Jalla. That's a different type of spending, but I'm not going to go into that. But now, I'm going to show you how Imam Ali alayhi salam brings it all the way around. So now, he says to us, the Prophet says, do not be that banker also. Why? Because if you don't take that action, who's going to take it at the end of your life? Imam Ali answers, and he says, he gets accounted for it while others spend it. You become that bank account for other people to spend. We want to what? Pile on money. But then he gives us something so beautiful. How to put our provisions on the back of others. Again, this whole thing is truly amazing to me. Because he sets it forth in such a way that, you know what? That person that you give to, don't think you're doing something for them. They're actually doing something for you. But do we think this way? That this person is actually what? Doing me a favor. How? Let's examine. Let's see what he says. He says, in this world, when you earn your provisions, don't become a bank account for others. What should you do with those provisions? He says, find some poor people. Find a poor person. And look at the way he puts this together. He says, find a poor person. And what? Give him. He says, put your provisions on his back. That's incredible. Why? When you think you're giving to someone, don't we feel sorry for that person? Don't we feel that what? We may be better than, off than this person? Don't these thoughts creep into your heart? Should you be feeling that way? Or should you be looking at this as an opportunity to what? Have him carry some provisions for you. Then he says, take it further. He says, don't just find one. He says, find many. Go after many, as many as you can, and load a caravan. Load as many people as you can with your provisions. And have them carry for you. Do we think this way? Look at the power of these concepts. Again, is it the presenter? No. Look at what's being presented. That's the difference. That's what makes us who we are. That's what makes us Shia. That's what makes us followers of who? These types of personalities that I guarantee you we don't value to this level. We don't. 
Because if you do value that person, you know what will happen to your heart? Your heart will become so tranquil, it's amazing. The emotions that you feel, no money can, can buy. Nothing, nothing, I'm telling you. When I look at these corporates and I look in their eyes, there's emptiness. But what we have is complete fulfillment. But it's not the currency that what? We're trading with. We're trading with a different types of currency. The currency you trade with with Allah. That gives you pleasure that you, no one can touch. No one can touch. No money can buy. That's a different type of currency. And Imam Ali is telling us what? How to do this. How to trade with Allah. Give, load others with your provisions so they can carry it for you. Wow. So now, he says, when you give, Imam, let's go back to him. He says, when you give, how should you do it? This is the beauty of Imam Ali alayhi salam. He just doesn't give you one simple example or he gives you one simple thing. No, you want to go deeper? Let's go. How should I even give? He says, number one, when you give, don't think it's a big deal. In your heart, look, he's speaking psychology now. Your own state of mind. This is internal. How you should be thinking of the giving. He says, when you give, don't think it's a big thing. Don't make it such a big deal. Because now, he's trying to what? Humble you. Because when we give on the exterior level, we should drop where? On the interior level. Imam Sajjad salam says what? وَلَا تَرْفَعْنِي فِي النَّاسِ دَرَجَةً don't raise me in the eyes of, if you raise me in the eyes of people, bring me down in the same degree internally. Look at your heart. This is massaging your heart. This is the power of dua. This is the power of who we have. That no one can talk like this. I guarantee you, no one can talk like this. Look, search. No one has what we have. No one. So now he says, number one, when you give, give and don't think it's a big deal. Do not think it's something big, that I'm doing something big. Because you can ruin that giving. So now number two, he says, when you do it, conceal it. Conceal it, why? This is another form of giving your provision. When you conceal it, sometimes we want to parade what we do. Look at me. Look, look what I'm doing. It's like someone who had, wants attention. Look at me, I'm a good person. You're trying to make yourself feel better internally. He says, conceal it. Why? Because you don't want it, don't parade here. Allah will parade it for you where? There. That's where your sh provisions should be. When, it par when Allah parades it, it's not like you're going to parade it. But Imam Ali says, why? He says, the more you parade it here, it's like a teeter-totter. The less it will be paraded over there. Conceal. If you think of Imam Ali and the way he used to do this, it just will blow your mind. Khalifa, king of the land, whatever you have, it's serving the, the lowest of the low in terms of his society. How do, you, how do you establish that kind of leadership within your own heart? How? Look at leaders. Look what happens to Obama when he comes here. They close off the highways. You have to sit there for hours. This man is in service of the, 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 the poorest of the poor. How do you get to that level as a leader? How? Humbleness. Secrecy. Keep it away. The heart is alive. I don't care what's on the outside. I care what's coming. Let Allah parade what you have. Don't try to do it yourself. Because Allah says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ I will raise who? Your name. If you do what I say. And if I raise it, there's no way you can market it the way I'm going to market it. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, on the third level, he says number one, do it and don't think it's a big deal. Number two, conceal it. Number three, when you see someone in need, don't wait. 
Imagine you see someone in a trial or a burden. He says, do it quickly. Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, du'a ma karam al-akhlaq, he says, وَالسَّبْقِ إِلَى الْفَضِيلَ Let me be the first to what? Do that good. The next time you see someone in need, what do you do? Don't wait. Don't wait to what? Where's your heart attached to? Again, check yourself. If your heart is attached to that money, believe me, you'll start holding back. I'll give you a quick example. Imam Ali was looking at his son in one battle. He says to him, he says, take the flag and go to the front lines. His son, not one of his main sons, but one of his other sons, he hesitates for a second. He says, what? I felt a flash of wind come by me. Who was it? Imam Ali alayhi salam. He had the flag and he was in the front lines. That's a leader. That's a general I want to follow. That's someone that his, what? My neck is between, between his feet. That's someone I can actually say I can do that with certainty. Why? Because everyone, I've said it before, and I've said it, I'll say it again. You are always following someone. But how much trust do you have to have in this person? That your soul is on the line. That's not an easy concept. Because he tells you, the only thing you could trade your soul for is what? The only thing is heaven. That's what you were created for. That's how much value you have within each person. Look, our little kids, every single person here. So he says what? Do it quickly. Don't wait. Second part. He says, if you don't want to give and just give to others without wanting anything in return, he says, give loans. Loan people. Again, load your provisions on others. Give. الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي الصَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ Those who give in times of hardship and in times of what? When they feel completely safe. But imagine when you have to give and you have nothing. That's very difficult. But imagine you're still secure and you're not worried about your provisions tomorrow. That's a different type of heart. That's elevation. That's security that no one can ever say that what money can give me. Because that heart is connected with the ultimate resource, which is who? Allah Azza wa Jal. So on that level, do it quickly. So now, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So now, he says, give loans. Even if the person defaults, you know when you're going to get back that loan? Watch what he says. He says, as you're traveling, load as many people as you can with your provisions. He's saying this, he says, but so you can travel light. You know, when we pack our, we're going on, you know, different vacations, four or five suitcases, Oh, I might need this, I might need that. He says, travel light. So take your provisions and put them on other people. Travel light, so you stay light. You stay lean. You stay fit. You can maneuver. Why? Look at the way he puts this. He says, because when you get to that crossroad, and he paints a picture as you're traveling as a traveler in this world, he says, Put your provisions on the backs of others. Because when you arrive at that intersection, when you have to cross, he says, you want to be what? Light. You don't want to have anything. Meaning, those attachments to the world, you don't want them on your back. You want them on who? The caravans that you've set. So now, when you come to that point of crossing, he says it's between two mountains. And he says it's like the valley in between, that every single person has to cross, namely, death. Everyone has to cross. But he says something so beautiful. The reason why you unload yourself to travel light, he says when you have to cross, 
He says, the one who travels light will cross quickly. No pain. Matching the Quran, saying, Allah swears by that, those angels that pull out the soul violently. And He swears by the angels who pull out the soul softly. When you're traveling light, it's easy to cross. But when you're not traveling light, it's much harder. All those things, the companies, everything else, someone's going to spend it, but you're going to pay for it when it comes to this position. Even through death, a lot more pain because you're attached to the wrong things. The heart is in the wrong place. It's attached to the wrong things. It's going, he says to you, he says it's going from a soft, comfortable life to something harder. You want to traverse that. You want to go from something what? Hard to something a lot easier. Where it's so welcome into your heart, you know exactly where you're going. That's that crossing. He says, that's why you loathe others so you can travel light. When you get to that crossing, you can cross with ease. Now when you cross with ease, he says, there's only two things now. He says, there's no going back. That's it. He says, قَالَ رَبِّ لَوْ لَا أَخَّرْتَنِي Allah says, he starts wishing, Allah take me back. <coughs> Allah says, وَلَا يَخْرُ اللَّهَ نَفْسًا I'm sorry. صَلَّى عَلَى مُحَمَّدُ وَعَلَى مُحَمَّدُ So on this point, Allah says to you, He says, Allah will not take you back for even an iota of time. You will not get anything back. That's it, you've crossed. He starts wishing, Allah, please send me back so I can do the right things and become amongst the righteous. He is awake now. When Imam Ali tells you, he says, Nasu nayam idha matun tabahu. People are asleep. When they die, they wake up. Don't be that person. Wake your heart. Attach it to the right things, which you need to attach it to the right concepts. And then give, put your provisions on others. When you give your put your, put your provisions on others, you can pass through lightly. And when you pass through lightly, you're in a good place. Your heart's in a good place. He says, when you get to this level, there's two abodes. The garden or the alternative. He says, in the garden, guess who will meet you there? All those provisions that you packed, it will arrive, and it will meet you there. But it's so beautiful, why? This gives you how much responsibility you have. You know why? Because those provisions are gonna build your garden. We expect that when we go to heaven, that Allah is gonna want, take us in as a guest, and He's gonna furnish everything for us. No. It's not the way it works. You are furnishing your garden right now. Right now, what you're doing right now because you made this decision to come here. And hopefully, Imam Ali has taught you something. He's telling you what to do. So your provisions will meet you there. You are setting them right now. After this, he says, be careful. Stay aware. Don't forget this aspect. When we are traveling in this world, I gave you the meaning of a value, of a principle, and what it is. And I'll repeat it because this is crucial to ending where you start. A value or a principle is a concept. Imagine your concepts flow with the Qur'an. But imagine when the Qur'an is read, you gravitate, your heart now is moving. It's connected to the concepts. That becomes you. When they say the Prophet was the walking, talking Qur'an, why? The Qur'an was up here, but it was also where? Down here. 
and those two were connected. That's a personality. At the end of the day, you're a set of concepts that's connected to a bunch of emotions. And the way they fuse will dictate your behavior. So you need to have the right concepts. Number one, namely knowledge. When you have that knowledge, you need to connect to those concepts. So much where they become a part of you. Imagine you're walking and they say, that's humbleness. That's gratitude. You will emit this, guaranteed. That's power. That's character. Where you don't have to show off and say, look at me, look at what I'm doing. It will resonate. You will vibrate the floor when you walk. That's how the prophet was. Why? His character was immense. And I always tell people, imagine he's sitting right in front of you. This is why. A man of character. And I'll end with this. In terms of our guides and who we have. Modern psychology has come and said, today, the most, the most credible sources of a leader is credibility, trustworthiness. Please, somebody tell me the prophet's nicknames and what he was called. SubhanAllah. This is who we have. Appreciate them, understand them, know them, because with me and all my studies, we don't value them to the point that we need to. Please, value them to that level so your kids can value them to that level. Why? Today we are fighting a psychological war. It's not an external war. They're after the kids, believe me. I study this stuff. Infuse yourself with the right concepts and the right motives so you can give it off to others. So this chain can continue. You're not the only one you're responsible for. You're responsible for many. But we need to learn how to appreciate what we have. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Questions, concepts, concerns, comments, something maybe you thought about during this, please share, because it's important. Is there something that affected you, something that, a thought process that triggered anything? So I, uh, I spoke to you about uh, helping others many times, and you, know, you mentioned something that takes place in a lot of the youth, the savior syndrome, that you know, everyone believes that they're the savior of this world, they want to save all the problems and whatnot. Uh, so you mentioned a few things. You said when someone is in need, be the first to do it and don't wait. And then you also said those who give in hardships and when they, when they feel safe. So how does this go along with the Savior Syndrome? If Imam Ali is telling us, you know, be the first um, to help others. Don't, don't prolong your help you're, sure. you're helping. But at the same time, what's the balance point? Excellent. How do you know, you know when Excellent. you're Excellent. going through that Savior Syndrome? Ex Excellent question. Savior syndrome is, it gives you the concept, meaning I want to save everyone. At the beginning, who entitled you in the first place? Save yourself. The savior syndrome is that kind of perspective where you, I want to save everyone because I think my ideas are right. Promote, I'm not saying not to. Give when you need to. But don't get to a point where you think you're so high up. That what? I give and I know it's accepted. Wow. Really? Do you know? My whole, the reason I was hired was to bring these people back to down to earth. That's the reason I was hired for that company. Because now I've made it. I'm at the top of my field. I'm earning money like you wouldn't believe. External growth, external arrogance. Don't think that others need saving. Think that I'm at the service of this person. 
but I'm at the service of Allah first. When I connect there, things will open up to you when it's situational. This is what I'm talking about. It's situational. You have to be able to study things. You can't just apply certain knowledge in the wrong situations. That's not wisdom. Imam Ali salam says to you, he says, apply knowledge in the right place at the right time. That's wisdom. Wisdom is application of knowledge when you need to apply it. So when he's telling you this, he's giving you general concepts of how you should be thinking. But it doesn't mean there are, there are no exceptions to the rule. That's how we always got to think. When do I apply? When do I do this? But your default system should be that. You see what I'm saying? So the default system, the general rule you should be following is that. But that's when they give you a rule. But there are certain situations you shouldn't do this for certain people. Because a part of that, if you go further, and it's a good question you asked. He says to you, a part of that hadith, he says, but be careful. There's another hadith he says with your brother. It's something different. But he says, when you are doing things for your brother, he gives you, when he, when he turns away, go towards him. When you do this, everything going after the other person. But he says to you, he says, but be careful. There are certain circumstances and certain people you shouldn't do this with. They're not deserving. You see what I'm saying? He gives you the exception even of when to act. But this is your part. You have to take this information in. You have to apply the right rules and keep yourself going to apply when to do this. That's what you're asking for. When do I do this? Or what situation? There's going to be a plethora of situations that may account. But he's giving you the general rule, but there are exceptions to the rule. So you have to learn when to do that. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, I enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have any advice for the youth who don't live in this area, which is low self Muslim, if you are surrounded by a Buddhist, a Jewish, a Christian, not only just the concept of giving, but sure. in general discussion, they say, I have my colleagues in, around my office are Buddhist, he says, I have a good heart. He gives a certain, he ran a marathon and he collected money from. Christian. Sure. On my right hand side, there is a very Christian person who says the only way is through Jesus and you have to give. So, do you have any advice in general for youth who are not living in this area but they go to university or company? I like to listen from you. From sure. Sure. Thank you for your question. It's an excellent question. Um, in general, the way I'm trying to understand, and correct me if I'm wrong. Let, let me follow up. Sure. Just to, to clear it up. What sets the school of what you say to me? Separate from other schools of thought. Sure. Th there's, this is a great question. Reason being, someone might come to you and say, how do you know you're right? This guy does the same thing. He gives, he feels the same feelings. How do you know you're right? How do you know? I could be completely wrong. So who's right? There's an almost, there, there's about 7 billion people now. Who's right? Who has the right thought process? Quick analysis to this. If you take every human being on the face of this earth and you ask them to come together on one thing, could they? It's impossible. You can never get general agreement. So man cannot dictate law because there's always oppositions. Always. One person's good thing is somebody else's what? Bad. So now who dictates the law? What is that median that needs to come into place? What is fair? If you look at a child, another child comes and takes a toy away from it. Why does it start crying? It's not fair. Justice is already set in the heart. So that's at the level we begin. It's, then they start verbalizing it. It's not fair. They took it away from me. It's not fair. Where is that medium of fairness? Where is it? Who sets it? 
what rules do you need to have to have that? Human beings can never dictate this because they can never come together and say why. We agree. There's always opposition. So it has to be divinely put for human beings to follow. It has to be. It's impossible otherwise. So when that's put and you establish that point that it is divinely put, just big, um, basic logic, then you say what? What is the best way to follow? Who do I follow? You're making yourself dependent. Why? Because I cannot dictate the rules. I cannot set the moral code. So now when that happens, you realize you have to get your motor, uh, moral code from something other than you. This is something Imam Ali alayhi salam says. He says he does not get his moral code from himself, but he gets his moral code from his God. So when you set this, now I have to, it's automatic. Now you go into school. Automatic. Because now it's not me. Something needs to teach me. I begin to what? Move in that realm. I start that endeavor. I have to see which is the best. What is best? Is it me? I already can't do that. So I have to follow a set of rules and regulations that something else other than me has set. Now, which are the best rules that bring me to the, my potential? The highest form of potential. This is where Tawheed comes into place. Set on that principle, no one can stand next to us. No one. I challenge anyone. Others have stood here before me and they've done the same thing. No one can challenge, challenge us on Tawheed. No one. Why? Because we have Ahlul Bayt If you can stand up here and tell me and say to me and give me a, a lecture or a sermon, really listen to this. If you can do that, talking about Allah Azza wa Jal without using the letter Alif in your sermon, I've talked to my teachers about this. This is almost like an impossibility. I study the brain. It's almost an impossibility. I can't say it can't be done because he did it. This is why. Th th I'm telling you, there's so much proof. What are, there's, really, yeah, there's nothing really difficult here. The gateway you pick to Allah has to know Allah. Because if he doesn't, what would happen? You've missed the target. You've missed the target. If he doesn't know Allah, you've missed the target. Because the door you walk through is the wrong door. And it's not difficult to pick the right door. It's not. Just look, search. Who will take you to Allah? Where we have a problem now in the world, and just take this with you. We look at the imams on a what? Vertical scale. Other schools of sect and sects look at us that we're looking at what? We're looking at it on a horizontal scale. That we're creating Imam Ali alayhi salam to Allah. It's not that they tell you shirk. Really? You missed the point. See? Small little equation, how it throws everything off. And you think you're going to have heaven. Really? This is not engaged. That's the problem. When you win Jihad al-Akbar, you will win Jihad al-Azghar. But you cannot do the other. You can't. You have to work on yourself first. This has to be connected properly. And if it's not, you've lost. And imagine what you're gambling with. So on this level, study Tawheed, number one. Everything stems from there. Don't take it for granted. I'm telling you, no one has what we have. No one. But it's our responsibility because we know what. And I can't make it any more clearer than that. So anyone who has any doubt, study Tawheed. Start looking into that. Study the oneness of Allah. And you see every other religion, every other part, I say it with confidence, falls apart. Because we have Ahlul Bayt who lead us to the correct door, who lead us to the Prophet, and the Prophet leads us to Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.
Any other questions, comments? Go ahead. What is a piece of advice you can give to somebody who wants to study the truth about us on a sensitive level to like really get the benefit that the body is sending from Um I, I love Nahj al Balagha for because when I came across that book, it just it changes your whole life. It, it really does. I'm not saying that just but I'm saying you will grow beyond belief. What I would say to you is really, number one, if you really want to study, get your Arabic to another level. You have to. You have to take your Arabic to it because the way he puts things in Arabic, there's nothing that can... And that's another thing I just want to touch on. I'm, thank you for bringing that up. We are losing the language. You wipe out language, you wipe out identity. That's guaranteed. It's very difficult. That's the part of the psychological war that we're facing. It's happening. You wipe out language, you wipe out identity. Don't take for this language for granted. Don't. So, language, go further. Have, make sure, make sure. Number two is you have a mentor. Don't take it and take the words and think you know what he means. Don't be your own interpreter. Don't dare to say something about the Imam or the Prophet that you think is right. Be careful with your own opinion. Because there's a lot of warnings here. And they give us a lot of red flags. If you're entitled and you've gained enough knowledge to give your own opinion, ala rasu aini, no problem. Do it. But when you give advice or when you talk to somebody else, Understand, if you give the wrong advice and that person expands and thinks this is knowledge when it's really ignorance, look at what you're doing to the other person. So make sure you have a mentor that can take you to the next level properly. Not the way you want to see it and the way you want to think about it. But again, get to a point where you can mentor someone else as well with the things you learn. So you're a teacher and a student at the same time. It's always that way. But the more you become and learn, the more you realize you're nothing but a student for the rest of your life. And the more your heart will be more sound. Good enough? That's good. Go ahead. Is it fair that there are some people in the world who are born uh, with the privilege of, of having Arabic as their first language while other people in their third and fourth struggle to learn the same language? Is it fair? Yes. <laughs> See, can I put you on the spot? No, I won't. I won't. Uh, automatically, just look at the lens you're looking through. Right away, watch what happens. When you say, is it fair? And everybody really try to pick up because this is a tool. He's created a comparison. Right there sets everything into perspective. Is this fair? There's a comparison. I'm comparing two things. Right or wrong? When you say, is it fair? Right away, whatever comes after, that's the comparison. Shaitan compared himself to who? Adam. We do this all the time. So, he's saying, I said, Right? When you're saying, is it fair, automatically you're pointing the finger other than yourself. That's another concept. You're pointing the finger outward. Because I wasn't responsible. This was done unto me, so it's not fair. I'm applying justice through my own perspective. That's another concept. This is why I didn't want to like, <laughs> I didn't want to put all this on you. But, subhanAllah, if you truly understand the way you question, and you really think about how the way you're questioning, your tongue would just shut itself. Because some of the concepts that sometimes we put out there, we don't understand their weight in the way we're questioning. So now, my form of justice is better than the ultimate justice in certain ways. I'm not saying you're doing that, but some people can get to this point. Because my perspective of what? The system. 
There's something wrong with the system. That means my perspective is higher than the system. Wow. You're saying I can create a better system because my opinion is better because this is not fair. It means I'm more just. Wow. See how much we think of ourselves? In psychology, this is called the... Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim I'm not going to go into the psychological levels. But what I'm saying to you with this, there's a, long, there's a longer explanation, but I'll just give it to you quickly. Allah Azza wa Jal, you may say, even at your own birth, we can just even take it further. How come someone's born as a Saudi prince and someone is born as what? Completely impoverished. He's in poverty. I can say right, da, right there, how is this a just system? I don't have to blame anyone or anything anymore. I'm blaming who? The creator. Right or wrong? How do you explain that one? Explain it. There's answers for everything. We have who? Who do we have that we don't value? Al-Bayt alayhi salam. The way he tells you this, when he gives you all the tools, and he sets your trials. When he sets your trials, he tells you you have every tool for every trial. That means, I want to give you something further. When we think we can change the way we look, the way we think, the way we are, especially when we want to change ourselves and we're stuck in that image factor. And we're going towards what? Facelifts have become like prominent now. It's like for 17 year olds, it's like skyrocketing. I can have a whole nother lecture on that, but I'm not gonna get into it. So when you want it, even the way you look is a tool for you to what? Meet your own perfection. You're special in your own way. The differences of your face make you what? Unique. And that uniqueness is for you to meet your own trial. That mountain that you're gonna climb is yours. It's no one else's. But where do we fall? We start comparing. We start comparing to others. And we say, this is not fair. When your own uniqueness is your specialty. He's telling you, look how much I give you. But again, do we understand this? It's very powerful what I'm really telling you. The reason is I've learned it from someone who's just the ultimate power. These are concepts. This, when this becomes you, comparison is no more. You know why? Because he gives you the answer. He says, contentment is a wealth that never exhausts. When you have contentment, do you compare anymore? You stop comparing. Allah, whatever I have, I'm happy with. And guess what? The heart doesn't move if I lose something or I gain it. Imagine that kind of character. He gives you the answer. But when I'm born, he gives me a set of tools to take on any challenge. And that challenge, he says, you start here and you're given certain tools. Let's say you don't have wealth, you're poor. He says, all you have to climb is this far. That's your perfection. But then he says, for this person that's given all these privileges, you have to climb this far. You see what I'm saying? That's the difference. Perfect, maintain uniqueness, but it's a beautiful system. That's powerful. Don't compare. Compare yourself in terms of, Imam Ali tells you, compare yourself in terms of knowledge. When you compare yourself in terms of material, compare yourself to someone beneath you or that doesn't have as much as you. That's, a good, that's positive. It's a different when you compare positively and when you compare negatively. That's a negative comparison. Answer your question. I'm sorry if I put you on the spot. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Was it somebody have? No. Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just remember who. Go, go ahead. No, go ahead. You had your hand up first. Okay. So you 
you're talking about being happy because that when you're content you're happy. True. But I don't think anyone's ever truly happy. You're always on the pursuit of happiness. You set miles to that. Mm. Let me graduate. I graduate, mm. am I happy? No, I gotta get a job. Oh, I gotta get I got a job. Am I happy? Yeah. Oh, I'm happy? No, I gotta do this, I gotta work hard. And you opened up one of the biggest philosophical questions. <laughs> that needs like that needs a class within itself. But uh, so we can discuss that if you want a little bit later. But yeah, it's a loaded question. It's it's too broad. It's like you have to build up so much just to to get there. But it's it's keep these no no. But keep these concepts. This is beautiful to be thinking about these things. It's it's truly amazing. You're in a good place when you're, when you're thinking about stuff like that. And, and especially when you're reflecting on, on happiness, emotions, who you are. These are great things. So reflect. Uh, I'd just like to give a comment just to that. In psychology, I don't know if you came across it. Something called the hedonic treadmill. Where uh, you perceive that when you gain something in this life, you're going to be happier at that stage. You may achieve happiness, but it's temporary when you start back at the beginning where your original feeling was. It's fluctuation. It's fluctuation. Yeah, so I think what he's saying is kind of correct, that you'll never reach a state of full contentment. You're, you're always on the pursuit of, of reaching that happiness. How, how does Imam Ali alayhi salam say that I've sat on the gate of my heart and let nothing in but Allah? So imagine, is Allah, does Allah, is Allah infinite? So imagine when you let Allah into your heart. You've let infinity into your heart. Do, do I have to go further? Like seriously. When you connect there, anything you do, any, anything you do, you're connected on a triangular system. Meaning, I connect there. I'm connecting to a higher ability. Think about that. I'm connecting to a higher ability. That's beyond my own capability. So when I do an action, my capability is limited. But when I connect there, my capability becomes what? Infinite. It's incredible when you involve Allah into the system, even with your own emotions. Understand that Allah is between a man and his heart. Imagine you can get to that level. هو الذي ينزل السكينة السكينة في قلوب المؤمنين. He's the one that brings down the tranquility in the heart of the believer. There's so many. إلا ما أت الله بقلب سليم. Except the ones who who come with Allah with a sound heart. You want to talk about happiness? I'm telling you, there's nothing that no one has. There's nothing that they have on us. No one. No one. I can stand up here all night. I love talking about this stuff. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry to take permission to compare it to devil's advocate. Sure. Um, the whole comparison thing, um, because we live in a relative world, but it's temporary, I think we live by comparing ourselves um, to, to other things. Like you said, Imam Ali says, compare yourself to the person who's lower than you on the scale of wealth, and become more satisfied with yourself, and compare yourself to the person who's higher than you knowledge, the growth of his uh, status. Um, so I think that's the way our mind works. That we're always comparing. So I think when it comes to Allah's uh, justice, I, I don't think it's saying that my justice is better than God's, but I'm just comparing God's justice to what I know justice means inside my heart. So when I look at the situation of the world, I see that... Can I stop you right there? But you just, you're looking at justice through your perspective. Well, I... I mean, but who's to say you have the right justice? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? We're like having conversations, and this is like should be personal conversation, but it's it's good. This is good. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. But I I have to interrupt you there in terms of just the way you're setting things up. That's all, because sometimes we have logic, premise, premise, conclusion. But sometimes we can put the wrong things in those in that premise, and we may think we have the right conclusion, but it doesn't work sometimes. So again, looking at justice through your own perspective, in the Quran it says, 
uh, so maintain that balance. Who says we're right? Who says your justice is right? That's the building process that we have to go through. But continue your question. I don't want to go into to that too further. Okay, so if my because you challenged the point. I'm challenging you right back. So if, if my justice in this circumstance is not right, right, I shouldn't look through my justice, then if I ask a question of justice in general of God, shouldn't there be an answer from that perspective? The, the way that I've seen it was answered that you know, we shouldn't ask that question because we're looking at the concept of just, justice through our perspective. Okay, so if I'm asking, not, not that, I'm not saying that I know what justice is, but I'm saying, is it just for God to create uh, people who, whose Arabic is their first language versus um, people who don't have access to Arabic, they have to go learn it at a higher age, which is much more difficult. Sure. I'm saying in the realm of justice, whatever it may be, how is this weighted? How is this calculated in the realm sure. of justice? Sure. Shouldn't there be okay. an answer? Can, can Allah come on the day of judgment? And you're saying this is unfair. Then you know what I'll do? Very simply. He'll bring a sheikh. It's never completely away from Arabic. Completely away from Arabic. Doesn't even know anything about Arabic. This person gets enlightened. They convert. Now they're spending days and nights. What? Learning the language. Then they go further. They memorize the Quran. Then they go further. They perfect their Arabic grammar. Then they go further. They become further than a sheikh. Even partial jurist or a jurist. You don't think people like that exist? Who's to say it's fair now? Point the finger back at you. So imagine that comparison. Very simple. Again, it's about us. Allah does not burden a person on anything. But they what? They burden themselves. So you'd say that the answer to that is there, there's a proof on this earth of people who worked and dedicated their time to learn the language versus others who don't. Because I'm giving you this why. Chinese person doesn't have value for the Arabic language. You have value for it. Right or wrong? There's no value to them. They have no idea how this works. But look how many Chinese people there are who are Muslims. Who know the Quran. More than you, me, me and any, a lot of people here. How is that possible? So didn't we just answer the question through our own justice? You have a relative perspective of justice, not the divine perspective. But we were able to give an answer. Sure, no, absolutely. But again, can you say with certainty yeah, I don't want to just, but let, let's have this talk somewhere else. It is just, so. I don't want to talk. Is there, yeah, okay. Yes. I was going to ask, would you be able to um, have, have a discussion afterwards? Sure, inshallah. Okay, so um, maybe we can pray for prayer and then whoever has remaining questions can ask them during the discussion. Salah ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah, wa salli ala Muhammad.